Bankless Nation, the Stark token is here. Well, just about, actually. We have the release details. We've been waiting for this event for almost six years. StarkNet has been one of the earliest and most promising layer twos, and they have just released the details of their token. They are provisioning it to users of StarkNet, to stakers in the Ethereum ecosystem, and to open source developers. We get into who is getting the Stark token, how much of the Stark token is getting distributed as a percentage. When does claiming actually begin? David, I just used this term provisions. Could you explain that for a minute? Uh, that is what a StarkNet version of an airdrop is. It is a provision. Uh, users will probably hear provisions, but they'll think airdrops. That would be correct. Uh, these are just the terms that they have elected to use. Uh, on the show today, we have Ellie Ben Sasson and Diego Olivia. Diego is the CEO of the StarkNet Foundation. Ellie, of course, is one of two StarkNet dads. Uh, these people have been with uh, the ecosystem for years now, especially Ellie, who has been working on Starks since before Ethereum was even a thing. Uh, and so we get into all the details that Ryan mentioned and more. Overall, just a long time coming for StarkNet. As soon as we knew that StarkNet was a thing, we all kind of knew that a token was going to be a thing. Uh, I went to the Starkware sessions a little over a year ago in Tel Aviv, Israel in February of, uh, of last year. And it was just very clear that this StarkNet, this network was being built upon the shoulders of this community who just really loves to be there. This very technical, low-level devs, Stark Maxis, I like to call them. Uh, and so this network is being born on the shoulders of this community that's very ready to receive it. Uh, and the distribution of the Stark token, STRK, is also something that's pretty notable, and we get into all these details in the show. Uh, if you are uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem, if you are an active participant, I, th I think you'll be pretty happy. Uh, let's go ahead and get into those details. But first, I want to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible, especially Kraken, our preferred place to buy, sell, trade crypto. If you do not have an account with Kraken in the year 2024, what are you doing? Click the link in the show notes to get started with Kraken today. Kraken knows crypto. Kraken's been in the crypto game for over a decade, and as one of the largest and most trusted exchanges in the industry, Kraken is on the journey with all of us to see what crypto can be. Human history is a story of progress. It's part of us, hardwired. We're designed to seek change everywhere, to improve, to strive. And if anything can be improved, why not finance? Crypto is a financial system designed with the modern world in mind. Instant permissionless and 24 seven. It's not perfect and nothing ever will be perfect, but crypto is a world changing technology at a time when the world needs it the most. That's the Kraken mission, to accelerate the global adoption of cryptocurrency so that you and the rest of the world can achieve financial freedom and inclusion. Head on over to kraken.com slash bankless to see what crypto can be. Not investment advice, crypto trading involves risk of loss. Cryptocurrency services are provided to US and US territory customers by Payward Ventures Eek, PVI doing business as Kraken. It's everyone's favorite season in crypto, tax season, and crypto tax is all Always an absolute headache, especially for all you DGENs out there. But it doesn't have to be a nightmare. That's where Crypto Tax Calculator comes in, the software built for DGENs by DGENs. As Coinbase's official global tax partner, Crypto Tax Calculator focuses on making complex transactions into easy ones, supporting over 300,000 currencies across Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, as well as a thousand other integrations as well. It's as simple as connecting your wallet, pulling in all your transactions, and following the automated suggestions to quickly and accurately calculate your tax obligations. Plus, for all the airdrop farmers out there, Crypto Tax Calculator has your back as they are consistently adding support for new and upcoming layer ones, layer twos, and all the airdrops that you're currently farming. 2024 is the year when the DGENs do their crypto taxes with speed and confidence. Make taxes this year easy and affordable with Crypto Tax Calculator. Sign up at CryptoTaxCalculator.io and get a 30% discount with code BANK30. Click the link in the show notes for more information. Celo is the mobile first EVM compatible carbon negative blockchain built for the real world. Driving real world use cases like mobile payments and mobile DeFi, and with Opera MiniPay as one of the fastest growing Web3 wallets, Celo is seeing a meteoric rise with over 300 million transactions and 1.5 million monthly active addresses. And now Celo is looking to come home to Ethereum as a layer two. Optimism, Polygon, Matter Labs, and Arbitrum have all thrown their hats in the ring for the Celo layer two to build upon their stacks. Why the competition? The Celo layer two will bring huge advantages like a decentralized sequencer, off-chain data availability, secured by Ethereum validators, and one block finality. What does that all mean for you? With Celo layer two, gas fees will stay low and you can even pay for gas natively using ERC20 tokens, sending crypto to phone numbers across wallets using Social Connect. But Celo is a community governed protocol. This means that Celo needs you to weigh in and make your voice heard. Join the conversation in the Celo forums, follow Celo on Twitter, and visit celo.org to shape the future of Ethereum. 
Bankless Nation, we've got an exciting episode for you here today. First, on the podcast, we got Diego Olivia, CEO of the StarkNet Foundation. Diego, welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yeah, very exciting. And of course, longtime Bankless listeners uh, will remember Ellie. Ellie Ben Sazen, one of the two fathers of StarkNet, co-founder of Starkware, overall mathematician genius. Ellie, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me here, David, Ryan. Always a pleasure. So this show, I think, is going to be extremely exciting. This has been a long time coming. Uh, Starkware, StarkNet, and overall Starks has been a pillar of the crypto world, even before Ethereum launched. Uh, and it's been no secret that eventually StarkNet will decentralize and create a token and give it to its community. And today appears to be that day. Ellie, you have been around since the very beginning. Um, why now? Why is today the right day to do this? Why is 2024 Q1 the right time to do this? Uh, what were some of the decisions and calculus into making this choice? Why now? It was the earliest possible in terms of uh, the technical and decentralization roadmap. Uh, we would have loved to do it uh, much earlier, but this is when the system is uh, ripe enough for it. We have now um, fees enabled in the StarkNet token, which is the main utility for it. Um, and we're making progress on other aspects of decentralization, like uh, staking for the purpose of uh, generating Stark proofs and sequencing uh, things. So this is just the earliest possible, and we would have loved to do it earlier if we could. So, Ellie, what were some of the necessary criteria for provisioning a token? You, you sort of alluded to a few of this, this being sort of the earliest necessary time. Like, what needed to be in place exactly? The, the main thing that just was turned on with version 13 of the protocol is that uh, we now have uh, the ability to submit transactions where the fee is denominated in the uh, Stark token. Uh, prior to this, uh, we just didn't have the, the, the protocol was not mature enough to support uh, this capability. So this took time to uh, uh, build and bake, and now the protocol is ready for it. So this is the, you know, so we, we are turning on the transferability of the token for the purpose of uh, paying for uh, transactions on StarkNet and later on to, so that it flows to the operators um, that will stake it in order to operate the system and maintain it secure and decentralized. Uh, we'll, we'll get into a lot of the kind of the economics of, of the token itself, but uh, since, since you just brought it up, uh, Elio, I, I want to drill into this. So the decision to denominate fees in uh, the StarkNet token itself, why did you go in that direction? There are other layer twos that have chosen to denominate fees in, say, Ether, uh, you know, some also have, have chosen to denominate their native token. That seems to be the direction that, that you're taking. Why? We need those who care about StarkNet, those who build it, those who maintain it and secure it through their work and operations. We need them to be the ones operating it, um, uh, ensuring it, and uh, also to be able to, to use it. And um, you see, if fees were denominated in Ether, they would flow towards the operators, and uh, also parts of it through things like Devonomics would flow to developers. But then all of those entities who care a lot about StarkNet would have a little bit of Ether, um, not enough to make a dent into uh, who controls uh, StarkNet. And this does not make sense. Uh, you need the decentralized layer two to be controlled by an answer to those who care about it, are passionate about it through their actions and operations. So you really need um, um, the token of the L2 to dictate uh, things like operation staking. And a fee mechanism is just a very good way to ensure that there's inclusivity, that uh, tokens and hence power and security is flowing towards, towards those who are uh, providing value to the network. Um, and of course, of of course, a um, you know a portion of the gas fees actually needs to, in some way, be converted uh, to ether in order to purchase the block space from the Ethereum mainnet. Am I right about that? And how does that work yes. in this mechanism? Yeah, well, a portion is indeed uh, paid to Ethereum for the security and for basically putting the proofs and the state uh, differences on layer one, but all of what's called the L two costs. Um, are going to be flowing to the operators and the stakers. And uh, some of those are related to the capital costs for staking and also to the um, you know cloud costs and other costs of operating the system. And those are going to be flowing 
uh, rightly to the entities who you know develop, maintain, secure, uh, care about uh, Starknet. Um, by the way, I wouldn't be surprised if other L2s, like uh, happened in other cases, um, you know, we are. Sometimes we're claimed to be unaligned, but we are truly aligned with, uh, you know, future proof technology and security. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we will also be trailblazing, uh, blazing a path here. And I wouldn't be surprised if you'll see other L2s also picking on this queue and uh, turning on fees in their own tokens. I wouldn't be surprised. Ellie, I think you might be alluding to um, uh, a tweet that I kind of fired off from the hip maybe about a month ago about like this exact subject, Stark using its own currency as its gas token. Uh, and I just wanted to like uh, just bring that up for a second because I called it like the most unaligned layer two, once again, just firing from the hip. And really what I just meant by that uh, was just like the, the strong technical differences uh, between StarkNet and Ethereum. Uh, like Ethereum alignment is kind of a meme, but I've always thought of it as like a technical conversation first and foremost, where you have like Optimism and Arbitrum going for EVM equivalents, trying to be one-to-one -one compatible. And StarkNet has always been um, just not, that's not its direction at all. StarkNet, I've kind of expressed, is a Stark maxi. They believe in Starks. The whole ecosystem believes in Starks and scaling out the power of Starks. Uh, and so like alignment was meant to be just like a technical differentiator, not any sort of statement about uh, being like uh, misaligned with Ethereum and, and, and spirit. And so I just wanted to, to clear that up with her. I'm actually having a conversation with Abdel from from Stark, uh, Starkware, Starknet on the on this very same subject. That'll be out. That'll be out soon. Um, and I just always thought it was like a curiosity is, is like what happens when Starknet leverages its own token for gas? I think the, the I just want to say that I think the Starknet ecosystem is eternally grateful to you, David, for, you know, raising up this meme and just giving us uh, <laughs> so much uh, good creative power. You know, we just really leaned into this uh, unaligned, you know, we're proudly unaligned. Uh, it's a great, uh, so, so you know, uh, thank you for uh, uh, the giving you, you the know, fodder. Yeah. Us, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Labeling <laughs> us as unaligned. It really helps us a lot. I'll, I'll, I'll rebrand it as uh, technically differentiated, perhaps. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's a better way to, to say it. Diego, I want to I want to get you in here as well. CEO of the Starknet Foundation. Maybe you kind of can uh, illuminate your role and the Starknet Foundation itself, and also maybe give your perspective on the choice of timing. Like why why is Starknet ready to be born, if you will? Because there's like the incubatory period of Starknet where all it's being like spun up, but now this is like now it's going out into the wild. It's you know, those kids getting dropped off at college, parents are saying goodbye, Starknet dads are, are, are waving goodbye like you're on your own now. Uh, Diego, give us a little bit of your perspective about the, the readiness of Starknet. Yeah, so I think, uh, well, uh, Eli alluded uh, the readiness from a technical standpoint, so I think he covered that. But I, I also think that it has taken some time for us, for our community and ecosystem to get to a point where it was also ready to start this journey uh, towards decentralization and, and hence the creation of the foundation as well. And, uh, and now, uh, as a foundation, we're trying to sort of uh, help the community lead its path uh, towards decentralization. And what that means, so uh, what does the, uh, what are the goals of the foundation? I can summarize them um, in three main points. One of them is about growth and decentralization. And growth means just getting uh, on board as many developers, teams, um, applications, infrastructure, tooling, uh, builders uh, to build on top of, of, uh, of Starknet to make us more uh, resilient and, um, and also to be more decentralized as we grow in terms of number of teams and builders. Uh, so that's one thing that we're going to be doing at the foundation, focusing on bringing teams on board through uh, education, obviously awareness, uh, all types of workshops, hackathon, hacker houses, um, uh, and also developer partnerships for those building tooling infrastructure here. So really orchestrating the growth of our ecosystem. So uh, nurturing that growth on our own. So that's number one objective. Number two is around helping nourish our community and culture. And, and here this, uh, uh, we believe is very, very important uh, because technology itself, making it work where uh, we're now at a point where we're scaling it in terms of uh, speed and reduction of cost, and that will continue. But actually, I think the bigger 
more long-term challenges, how do we scale a team of teams? And I think it's going to be very important to get uh, like, you know, tens of thousands, hopefully, of developers and thousands of teams to work towards one mission, uh, all, even if you have, uh, you know, DeFi protocols or gaming companies or whatever it may be, that, and even competing ones that we are all aligned by one goal of what we're trying to achieve uh, uh, with StartNet. And hence, we need to figure out a way to work together, to collaborate, to bring StartNet uh, forward. And I think that's, again, as a foundation, we need to uh, facilitate those processes um, and uh, and make sure that we are aligned on the values that we have uh, on StartNet as a community. And, and, uh, uh, and the foundation is sort of Kind of leading from behind, just trying to see how we help the community find its own uh, uh, feet in in this growth. And last, uh, but related, last goal would be around uh, governance and delivery. So, once we build that community, that culture, then what does that mean in terms of how we execute together? So, how do we figure out processes in terms of uh, the committees, the necessary committees or councils? How we make decisions around uh, the product roadmap? Uh, where, what features should come first? What verticals should we try to tackle? How differentiate we differentiate ourselves? What type of research should we be engaging in, uh, and so forth? But also being sure, like trying to help on the delivery. So, not because of governance and trying to, of course include as many teams and the voices of many people that we lack speed because we need to be able to be inclusive in terms of decision making uh, but at the same time we need to deliver at pace so we need to be as effective as I think a centralized organization and, and that's going to be like a paramount like a really big challenge and I think if we manage as a foundation to help the community solve these three goals I think we're, we're going to be going a long way so, so it's a lot of work in the years ahead. So this this design where we have um, Ellie with the the, the co-founder of, of Starkware, which is a, a company, and uh, Diego, you are the CEO of the Starknet Foundation. We've seen sort of company plus foundation types of uh, setups in other ecosystems. Uh, other layer twos have adopted this sort of uh, setup. Uh, DeFi protocols have, you know, with Uniswap, you have Uniswap the company and there's Uniswap the foundation. So I think a lot of uh, bankless listeners will understand uh, the basics of this model, that there's two kind of entities. And and I'm wondering if it's it's sort of, it works the same or like, you know, uh, Ellie, what, what what is Starkware going to be doing moving forward versus what is the, the foundation going to be doing? I mean, is, is, is Starkware done? Is the work finished? Is it now passed <laughs> to the foundation or there's still more work to do? Just talk to us about this, maybe relate it to other foundation plus company designs we've seen in crypto. One thing that's important to note that I think in which... Um, the StarkNet Foundation is unique is that in most cases uh, you have sort of uh, labs and then undergoing uh, mitosis, right? This uh, mm. process in biology where a cell splits evenly into two parts and then one part is called uh, labs and the other part is called uh, foundation. Um, the StarkNet Foundation is uh, uniquely uh, different in this respect. It is truly independent and you don't see... Uh, anyone from the sort of core founding team, and certainly not an even split. Um, it's not that uh, the labs has uh, done mitosis. And I think um, the main thing about this, and again, it goes back to, you know, um, things about like vision and values. Um, we take uh, decentralization very seriously. And the long-term viability of StarkNet as uh, an integrity web, as something that can be trusted by the public uh, all around the world, uh, really calls for this sort of uh, independence. Um, now, regarding Starkware, it has so much to do, to do and it's also having such, so much fun doing it that, uh, no, we're not going to go off to the Bahamas to drink uh, <laughs> cocktails and bathe in the sun. Um, we are... <sighs> As will be evident in the coming weeks, um, we're all about like uh, trailblazing technology. So we have some very exciting technological breakthroughs to share with the world further on. Our vision is, a, or our passion and our focus is on improving the technology even more. And the reason is that um, if you want to become the rails for the global economy, 
then, you know, as amazing as uh, StarkNet performance is right now, um, it's not yet ready for, you know, the 1 million TPS and more that you probably need uh, for that. Now, we'll get there. There's nothing theoretically barring uh, the technology from reaching it. But uh, to, to, to answer your question, what will StarkWare do? So alongside many other uh, teams in the StarkNet ecosystem will be uh, advancing um, that mission and that vision of uh, taking it uh, really global. I mean, from, from the foundation, what I can say is what I would uh, hope and expect is for StarkWare to uh, ship more and more as years go by, but their share going down and down uh, because of all the other builders. So I think Starkware, we th definitely work very closely and they, they are a really important contributor and we expect them to increase uh, what they ship, but actually reduce their uh, their share significantly as we grow the rest of the ecosystem, which is uh, what's uh, really exciting. Maybe the differences in roles between these two organizations is actually com uh, contained in the name Starkware, as in software. I'm pretty sure that's the the right playoff of words. Software, except for Starks, uh, and this is the model that I think we've seen um, other uh, organizations take, where the original labs company becomes like the software service provider towards the actual network, StarkNet, Net being everything else that it takes to foster and maintain and develop uh, a network. Okay, so Diego, today is the date where we're getting a lot of the information, uh, and th well, there will there'll be a link in the show notes on the YouTube uh, for people to be able to just go read this blog um, themselves, but maybe you can kind of just rattle off some of the, the big specific dates. Uh, when will this provision be uh, accessible towards the people that have been provisioned? Uh, and then we'll also get into some of the details behind who got what. Yes, so... Uh... Today we're announcing uh, the provisions and now you can go uh, to uh, our website to check eligibility. So you can go there today and then uh, the actual claim of the tokens will happen on February 20th next week. So let's go ahead and get right into some of the details on the, the provisions here. And Diego, I'll, I'll continue with you here. What, what are the things that just really stand out uh, as the big details about what about these, this provision program? Like what uh, populations of people, what contributors, uh, what, what do you want to highlight first before we get into some of the granular details? Yeah, so we're going to be distributing 700 million star tokens. Uh, to around 1.3 million addresses, which is the largest distribution ever made, which we're very, very proud of. Uh, and I think that's very, very exciting to try to include as many people to come on board the StarkNet and also Ethereum journey. So we're very excited about that. 1.3 million addresses. Uh, can you uh, start to like unpack who are these people? Uh, what are the different um, uh, communities or just collections of people are receiving provisions here? Yes, so uh, over 50% uh, of the tokens are going to be going to StartNet users. So those that help us really get, uh, we're trying the applications, getting it ready, uh, 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 improving the usage, giving feedback to the builders and so forth. Uh, we have also uh, uh, close to 9% going to the StartNet community, which includes everyone uh, from developers uh, to also those uh, organizing meetups, uh, uh, helping other developers to learn, um, helping everyone get acquainted with uh, what Starting is about, um, all the efforts about building our community that are uh, going to be receiving tokens there. We also have around 2% of the uh, of the distribution going for StarkNet developers. So people that have really contributed to, uh, uh, to the tooling and infrastructure uh, that makes StarkNet uh, possible. Um, and we're also having a uh, a, a good portion of uh, tokens distributed to those contributing to Ethereum. And that is from um, uh, ETH stakers. So uh, we, th we think that it's very important that they have helped secure the network. So we want them to be uh, uh, compensated as well. So we have those that are doing it via pools and that's around 17% uh, of the distribution. And we have also uh, uh, around 5% of the distribution going to solo stakers that also take uh, a bit more risk on that, but that are again, supporting uh, the network. Uh, we have also an allocation to the protocol guild of Ethereum. So those that have helped um, uh, uh, maintain and secure Ethereum as well. Uh, those are also have been doing uh, uh, 
uh, the EIP authors as well have an allocation as well. And then we have 2.1% uh, going to uh, the top 5,000 GitHub projects as well, um, uh, which we're very happy again. We're trying to welcome as many developers uh, to come to uh, start it and contribute to Ethereum, broadly speaking. So I encourage all of you to go uh, to, uh, the, to our website to check for eligibility and please be aware of scams. There is no uh, token available yet. Uh, the claim of the tokens will be next week on, on the 20th, but go check eligibility uh, as soon as possible. I, I got to say with um, all of the solo stakers and Ethereum developers and the protocol guild out there, it, it sounds like David, a pretty aligned move here. Pretty, I, I don't know. I don't know what you tweet aligned. about this, but uh, <laughs> I, I do think like a... Um, a token distribution, token provisioning type of event sort of uh, shows you a little bit where the network's values are and like what they're trying to incent moving forward. And um, I just want to applaud, um, you know, so, some rewards for some of the groups that that uh, you guys have decided to include there. But just before, I know David's going to do a recap in detail, so we make sure we capture all that detail. But before we get there, when you were talking about the percentage that are going to all these various groups, Diego, you were talking about a percentage of the 700 million uh, Stark token distribution. It was relative to that, that, that 700 yes, million that, amount. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, and then the wider context of this, uh, this is a new token. So uh, what is the total supply of this new token? So we can take even the 700 million into context here. Yes, the total supply of Stark token uh, is of 10 billion Stark tokens. Uh, we still are working on the overall uh, tokenomics of it. So we are still going to be uh, working on proposals that we have uh, to uh, uh, decide also inflation, uh, which at the moment, one of the proposals is around 4%. But for the time being, we do have uh, 10 billion Stark tokens. Okay, so I kind of want to just re recap the high level categories that I see. I see four different categories here. Um, the big one is StarkNet users. So just users of StarkNet. Uh, if you've, it sounds like if you just have an address that has produced a footprint on StarkNet, you are getting a provision. Um, and that's just, that's just the biggest category. That's probably where a lot of the addresses come from. There's a, the, and then there's the second category that I want to pull out, Ethereum stakers. And can we just uh, talk about this category specifically really quick? Then there's the two other categories. Um, these are both solo stakers and staking pools, correct, Diego? And can you talk about That's just correct. like the parameters around, I don't know if I've ever heard of a, uh, of a uh, um, provision going to staking pools. Can you talk about the logistics behind that? Uh, and just any dates that are uh, relevant here. Maybe I can, I'd be happy to take yeah. this question. Um, the first thing I want to point out is the rationale behind uh, allocating to, to stakers. Please, yeah. And uh, remember that um, um, StarkNet decentralization calls for having as broad as possible um, a set of uh, individuals and a public that is interested in the operation and securing of decentralized networks. And if you ask yourself, okay, where can we find uh, people who through their actions have demonstrated that they are passionate about this and want to help? And one glaring answer is, of course, uh, you know, folks like miners and stakers and operators. So when you're uh, jumpstarting um, this uh, broad footing or distribution or foundation for the decentralized operation, it just makes a lot of sense to include this class and uh that's but that's Ellie, the reason is it basically allocate. because you you want them to come stake in the starknet ecosystem we want a, a broad set of independent operators so that you have a permissionless decentralized network and uh, you ask yourself who's going to step up and and be willing to take the to, you know and has the technological and security understanding of the implications of things like staking and slashing and the you know responsibility uh, that is entailed by it you know basically entrusting uh, and securing funds uh, for the public and a very natural class that is already presenting itself and saying hey we're into that sort of thing are ethereum stakers so we want them to be part of this just like we want starknet developers to be uh, sitting at the table and, uh, you know, if they're passionate about building things on StarkNet as a public good, we want them to have tokens so they can 
um, operate the system. Mantle, formerly known as BitDAO, is the first DAO-led Web3 ecosystem, all built on top of Mantle's first core product, the Mantle Network, a brand new high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 built using the OP stack, but uses Eigenlayer's data availability solution instead of the expensive Ethereum Layer 1. Not only does this reduce Mantle Network's gas fees by 80%, but it also reduces gas fee volatility, providing a more stable foundation for Mantle's applications. The Mantle Treasury is one of the biggest DAO-owned treasuries, which is seeding an ecosystem of projects from all around the Web3 space for Mantle. Mantle already has sub-communities from around Web3 onboarded, like Game7 for Web3 Gaming, and Bybit for TVL and Liquidity and OnRails. So if you want to build on the Mantle network, Mantle is offering a grants program that provides milestone-based funding to promising projects that help expand, secure, and decentralize Mantle. If you want to get started working with the first DAO-led Layer 2 ecosystem, check out Mantle at mantle.xyz and follow them on Twitter at 0xMantle. You know Uniswap, it's the world's largest decentralized exchange with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume. You know this because we talk about it endlessly on Bankless. It's Uniswap, but Uniswap is becoming so much more. Uniswap Labs just released the Uniswap Mobile Wallet for iOS, the newest, easiest way to trade tokens on the go. With a Uniswap wallet, you can easily create or import a new wallet, buy crypto on any available exchange with your debit card with extremely low fiat on-ramp fees, and you can seamlessly swap on Mainnet, Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism. On the Uniswap mobile wallet, you can store and display your beautiful NFTs, and you can also explore Web3 with the in-app search features, market leaderboards, and price charts, or use Wallet Connect to connect to any Web3 application. So you can now go directly to DeFi with the Uniswap mobile wallet. Save simple custody from the most trusted team in DeFi. Download the Uniswap wallet today on iOS. There's a link in the show notes. Are you launching a token? Is it already live? How are you managing the legal and tax obligations for providing token grants to your team? It's no secret that token management gets complicated. Between learning all the legal language and tax obligations in every country that your team is in, token grant management can feel like an obstacle course, but it doesn't have to. That's where Toku steps in. Toku provides practical tools to handle token grants, allowing for effective oversight of token distributions and payroll tax compliance for employees, contractors, advisors, and investors. They also handle tax withholding through their real-time tax calculations that can be done by Toku or integrated into any payroll EOR providers in any jurisdiction. Toku is a trusted provider of Protocol Labs, DYDX Foundation, Mina Protocol, and many more. Get started for free and make token compensation simple at toku.com slash bankless. Diego, one of the uh, provisions here is to uh, staking pools, which I think might be uh, logistically novel. I don't know if we've ever seen that before. Can you talk about just uh, if w- what that means, if how if we're receiving a provision via a staking pool? Like what, what should people know? Uh, well, for all of, of you that are staking via a pool, then you need to contact your uh, uh, pool operator uh, to get information on how you can get your Stark. Uh, but for all of you doing uh, solo staking, then uh, be sure to go to our website to check uh, eligibility. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so that's the very, relatively large Ethereum stakers category. Uh, the next category of of the what well, the pattern that I've seen here is what I'll call kind of like the pre Starknet ecosystem, and this is Stark X users, um, and then the Starknet uh, developers, which we already went into pretty good detail, and then the Starknet community. I want to hang on this Stark X users. Uh, who are these people? Uh, Stark X. Uh, who are some of these products that have been out in the wild for the number last number of years? That if um, people have used these things, they would be considered here. Who, who are Stark X users? So Stark X users. Uh, first of all, the technology underlying Starknet is completely novel. Um, it is uh, you know the first usage of Stark proofs alongside a, a novel virtual machine. Uh, Cairo and a programming language that is ergonomic and safe that uses it, and all of this in production. Now, the first setting in which this novel L2 was tested and brought to production was through the StarkX systems. And the Cairo language, which now supports StarkNet, um, was honed and finessed on that platform. So the foundations of StarkNet and its security and its, uh, um, you know, UX and a lot of other good properties about it are inherited uh, from StarkX and have been tested and vetted by the users of DYDX, Sorare, Immutable, uh, Rhino, and a bunch of others. And um, just like the users of StarkNet have offered uh, a terrific service 
to StarkNet, and uh, they are natural candidates to be provisioned so that they can participate in the journey that is StarkNet. The same thing uh, applies to the early users of the technology on StarkX. Um, along the way, this will be another class that hopefully brings many novel uh, uh, Web2 people to uh, the Web3 setting because some of the users, for instance, of uh, Sorare and other of these systems okay. are not necessarily native Web3, and this will be a, a good way to introduce them to uh, Web3 technology. Yeah, we actually often talk about um, trying to build products for mainstream, and, and Sorare has already done that. Uh, and so these might be like a large supply of addresses that uh, don't know that they are getting a, a token, a very important uh, token. Um, and then I think like you just called out DYDX, uh, the first implementation of DYDX uh, was a Stark X chain, which uh, I believe I will be getting a provision uh, from my early degeneracy in 2019 and, and 2020 when I was using DYDX. Uh, and then uh, Immutable, for anyone who was using Gods Unchained or some of the early uh, gaming platforms, a uh, pretty wide set uh, of users here to, because the history of Stark X uh, chains go, goes back really, really far. Uh, and so I, and you also called out uh, Rhino, previously known as uh, Diversify, I believe, uh, a very early um, uh, exchange using um, StarkX as well. So uh, that is probably a pretty broad set of people who have been inside of the Ethereum and, and crypto community for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's what I call the pre-StarkNet ecosystem. And then there's the Ethereum builders, 1% to the Protocol Guild, 3.3% uh, of all Ethereum developers who contributed at least three commits before November in 2023, EIP authors, and then, of course, that last uh, category, the StarkNet users. Uh, okay, uh, 1.3 million addresses. Uh, by far the largest uh, distribution in address term. One more time, I know we've talked about some of the, the logistics and details here, uh, but there's been a lot of fissures in this world. But uh, Diego, just give us the dates and what people need to do. Uh, there's a link in the show notes for all of this information. Just give us the dates one more time about uh, when um, uh, uh, people can go access their provision. Yes. So today you should go to our website uh, to check for eligibility. So uh, uh, you should go there as soon as possible. Uh, but the claim itself starts on the 20th of February. Uh, so nothing before that uh, is real. So be, be careful with scams and emails and things that people are already unfortunately sending. Uh, nothing will be happening on to February 20th. And be sure to check the official handles of the foundation and, and just always double check that uh, you're going to the right place. But again, I repeat today, go check eligibility on our website and the claim starts on February 20th. And the story actually is not over. This is the StarkNet provisions program and this is the first provision of more. Uh, can you talk about the future? What does the future of this program look like? How will future provisions be de determined and decided? So for us, actually, this is a, a, a very important milestone for our community because it, it, it has taken a lot of work of a lot of people believing in StarkNet uh, users, builders, all together to get to this point. And it is a very important point in our, in our history, but it's really the beginning. So uh, this is just a way, a first step in terms of decentralization to get all these 1.3 million addresses, sort of a, a, a stake in our protocol and for them to participate. Uh, but ultimately, this is going to be a marathon. So what we would like is uh, uh, for more people to come and build and, you know, build great infrastructure, great tooling, great uh, dApps on StarkNet, uh, and that should be part of the community. And what we want to do is to continue to nourish that through the foundation with all the programs we will have and, and just invite them to participate in this journey of just basically uh, making, making StarkNet and Ethereum uh, better. So, so this is just the first step. That's why it's the first step in uh, provisions, but there will be more, more things to come. And we have already other programs and you know all types of grants and education we provide uh, for builders. Uh, and, and users as well. If I may, I just want to say it's a, it's really a day of a big celebration for the StarkNet community. Uh, first and foremost, uh, for the amazing ecosystem of developers um, and visionaries who've gone um, through so much uh, and really devoted their past few 
months or years to making this uh, such a success. And it is a milestone in the road to decentralization and to uh, independence and flourishing of, of Starknet as an important uh, layer two scaling Ethereum and bringing uh, Web3 to global usage. I appreciate um, you guys uh, releasing all these details. And, and this episode goes live on Valentine's Day, too. So, you know, it's the, the 14th of February. So uh, maybe maybe there's some love in the air uh, to to the StarkNet community. And so the 14th, this is uh, being announced. The 20th, um, people can actually access their tokens for the first time. And so they should go see if they're eligible. And then they should go access them. But my question is, then what? So... I got some tokens. Cool. Maybe David's got some tokens from his DYDX stuff uh, back a few years ago. Then the question in my mind is, now what? What do I do with these tokens? So can I stake them? Should I just wait and hold on? Are there governance proposals to uh, get involved with? Because, of course, uh, you know, provisioning a token like this with, with great token comes great responsibility. Tell us what some of the responsibilities are for token holders. So I can answer this. First of all, uh, governance has been already live for quite some time. And uh, you, could, you are urged to participate in governance or, uh, you know, if you want to be a, a delegate uh, for others to de delegate their governance uh, rights to you, please consider doing so. Um, there are a number of uh, staking related, related proposals in the works by various teams. Um, there will be... Um, you know, there will be a number of staking proposals. Uh, I know for a fact because Starkware is again working on uh, one such uh, proposal. Um, and but but you know, it's not. This is not yet live. Um, I would say that uh, you are urged to explore all of the cool things that are now live on um, on Starknet. They're very interesting: gaming, sustainability, DeFi and other uh, products and protocols. Um, I, I don't want to mention anyone in particular just because uh, there's so many of them and I will probably do a disservice to the others. Uh, but explore the ecosystem, see what you believe in, um, and see what brings uh, value to you. Uh, I think there's a large number of uh, very interesting things to participate in there. Well, one, one cool thing about these uh, tokens, of course, is that they are gas tokens. So, of course, you know, all of the things that, that Ellie was just talking about, now you can pay for those things. If you're a recipient of the, the StarkNet token, you can actually uh, use them within the system. Uh, Die Diego, were you going to say something too? Well, I, I think also, um, um, I think we, we see it as well as an opportunity to... Uh, inspire other builders, inspire users to come and experience not only the, the, the dApps that are already here, but what's possible with, with this technology. So hopefully uh, this distribution brings uh, many more people uh, uh, or makes m many more people aware of StarkNet and what you can do with uh, the StarkNet uh, network. And, uh, and hopefully the token is part of that uh, discovery, uh, but uh, it's not really the goal. It's just part of the mechanism we use to build some amazing things. So, so I, I do hope that people are encouraged to then sort of come and visit the StartNet world, experience already what's out there, and be inspired to to build and participate in, in, in the ecosystem. Well, as we end this episode, let's talk about that for a moment. So when a token is provisioned, of course, you know, the, the full spotlight of everything in crypto is on that particular project. And so I imagine for the next uh, few weeks, the full spotlight will be on, on StarkNet. And so I'm wondering if this is maybe for, for people who are not as familiar with the StarkNet community, what are the most uh, exciting things going on in the community? And Ellie, you don't have to name particular projects unless, of course, you want to, but you can talk about maybe categories. You can talk about maybe the future roadmap of, of StarkNet. What to you is most exciting about traction and some of the, the real world use cases and things going on that people should come explore? One huge theme that is already exploding on StarkNet is on-chain gaming, right? Um, it's very hard to put the on-chain, uh, the logic of a game on-chain because uh, that's a lot of compute. Well, on StarkNet, with its scale, uh, this is possible. Um, so there's 
a lot of very interesting on-chain gaming projects out there. Please explore them. That's one thing that I'm very enthusiastic about. Another thing is just um, the sheer performance and cost improvements that are in line. We hope to be ready with EAP 4844 support pretty much from the minute it's uh, turned on. Uh, there is a lot of work going on on uh, regarding further enhancements to the performance in terms of number of compute steps and simultaneously reduction of the cost uh, to users, which will make uh, StarkNet uh, much faster and cheaper. Um, um, now, another thing that is unique to StarkNet and goes again to our technological um, innovation and sort of uh, independence and, uh, you know, courage, I would say, technological courage, is that um, StarkNet is the only L2 with 100% native account abstraction, which means amazing web tool like UX for both the onboarding and the usage. So I think users coming already to claim the token uh, are expected to see a very novel, uh, well, novel for Web3, but uh, kind of expected in Web2. And uh, I think we'll see a lot more usage of things like uh, smart wallets, you know, aka account abstraction uh, by a lot of the major wallets and DeFi protocols. Um, and then further down the line, one thing to keep an eye on is that, so let, let's take a very broad view. So StarkNet now with its token is something that has been, you know, being baked in the oven for roughly six years. Uh, Starker started working on it uh, in 2018. And prior to this, uh, there was like 20 years of uh, research, at least. Um, I myself devoted probably a decade of research to that. Um, we are very enthusiastic about some big technological breakthroughs on both the product and the engineering and the math side that are going to be unveiled in the coming weeks. And it will take some time, you know, months to years for them to reach uh, uh, production and for everyone to enjoy them. But uh, that's that's where our passion lies and that's where we're focusing on, on the horizon, on long-term viability. Um, that's where we're heading. Well, when I hear you say te technological breakthroughs, I get very excited because Starkware has always been uh, pushing the frontier of crypto and certainly has on L2s from the very beginning and uh, you know Stark's uh, math and technology and, and cryptography so far. So we, w one thing I'll, I'll plus one is the on-chain gaming community in the StarkNet ecosystem is absolutely popping off. Um, that's where I see a ton of the, the energy and potential. And uh, also account abstraction wallets. So Bankless Listener, you've heard David and I talk about these before. This is an experience that's similar to FinTech. Revolut, it's similar to uh, Venmo if you use something like that. It's not kind of the, the, the clunky um, EOA type of account that we're used to in most layer twos. And on Ethereum is certainly the future. And one benefit is that StarkNet has that baked in uh, from the ground up. There, there's a wallet that um, I've been a big fan of for a while called Argent that actually completely migrated and deployed to StarkNet, I believe in large part for account abstraction type of support. So this is definitely a frontier and has some differentiators from other L2s that you should absolutely look into. Uh, Diego, anything else you want to say in conclusion? What's uh, how, you know, how do we wrap up this episode in this monumentous event? For me, if I can say something, I think uh, uh, you're absolutely right, and, and Ellie summarized it well. Like we have incredible math, uh, cryptography technology. Uh, it, it's really mind blowing. But I can tell you that many people for come for the tech, but stay for the community. One thing that is, I feel like, really, really. Uh, encouraging and uh, what makes StartNet great is actually the community of builders we have, how everyone helps each other and also just a broader community of users as well. I think everyone is very, very passionate about what we're doing here together and also uh, and passionate to the extent that we always take the more difficult road with Cairo as a language and, and, uh, uh, and, and just the differences we have in the way we, we build different, uh, but the support you get from the community uh, in gaming or in any other field is, is very unique. So I, I would just say that uh, please do come, enjoy the tech, come for the tech, but I'm pretty certain you'll stay for our community. 
All right, Ellie, anything, any uh, last comments from you? Yeah, so a lot of the excitement, including uh, next steps and things that will be unfolding, some of that will be already revealed uh, at uh, Stark City, Denver, uh, which will take place uh, as part of uh, East Denver on February 28th. So please join us, uh, Diego, uh, myself, a lot of the StarkNet Foundation and StarkWare and StarkNet ecosystem folks are going to be there. We'd love to tell you what's on our minds, uh, what we're working on and just celebrate uh, StarkNet. Amazing. Uh, Ellie, Diego, thank you so much for joining us. It's Congrats. certainly big news. Congrats. It's been a long journey, a six-year journey. You, you guys have done this very methodically, and uh, we certainly appreciate you spending time to educate the Bankless Nation on what's going on. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bankless listeners, there will be there will be links in the show notes, of course. One to the blog post, which you've got to check out, has all the distribution details. Anything we didn't cover in this episode will be there. There will also be a link to the eligibility criteria that Diego kept mentioning throughout this episode. Uh, that is the official place to check whether you are yeah, eligible. Careful about other links. Yes. At the time of release of this episode, that is February 14th, to be clear, you will not be able to actually claim any stark tokens okay that happens later that happens on the 20th but you can check your eligibility so make sure you don't get fish you don't get scammed also we'll include a link to details on the eth denver event that ellie was talking about gotta end with this of course crypto is risky you could lose what you put in but we are headed west this is the frontier it's not for everyone but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey thanks a lot 